Shirley Adams for the Sewing Connection Series 17, Program 5. Today we're dealing with sheer fabrics and those I've used just happen to be the blues and greens of watercolors. But think of that water equality, the transparency. Because you can see through it, how will you deal with construction techniques? The sleeves and the blouse I have are just that one layer of transparent fabric and that's fine for sleeves but for other areas you might want more. For instance, for the body of the blouse, maybe I'd want to line it with something, or maybe I'd want to wear a camisole under it. So you have to think exactly how wearable it is, or as I'm doing right now, wearing a vest over it. Notice though in the collar and the cuffs, uh, you don't see through them, they are heavier. And that's because I have three layers of fabric there. Now usually you just use in collars and cuffs two layers of fabric, top and bottom, and put a layer of interfacing in between. But uh, anytime a fabric's transparent, I usually just use three layers of that fashion fabric because that works out well. And uh, what I have down here on the table is a scarf. And actually, that's what started this whole outfit. I just bought enough fabric for this scarf last year. And then I put the charmeuse ends on it to make it long enough since it was only 45 inches and a scarf like this needs to be more like 60 inches to make it hang right. Uh, well, I just bought this. And here you see two layers of it, of course, because there's a seam on one side. There's a fold on the other side. So it's just two layers. And that looks nice. But here I have one layer, and it doesn't look nice with the white under it because it just washes it out. So you really need more layers to bring out the depth of the color and to make it look a lot prettier. Now what also happened when I brought home that fabric for the scarf is I didn't end up with nearly as much as I had anticipated. The reason for that is in the shop, they really can't take time to cut things so that they're thread perfect. They instead just cut them off the bolt, kind of measuring how it is. And it's a s straight measurement, but it's not necessarily straight with the fabric. And most of these fabrics you have to use so that they are straight. Well, here's how you would get them straight for starters. See how this ravelly end that they cut uh, is falling apart. These fabrics do ravel easily, so you have to handle them quickly and handle them safely so that they won't keep on doing that. But what I would do with this after I got it home, I'd perhaps buy a little extra in the first place because you know you're going to lose some, and that's what happened on the scarf. I lost a little bit of yardage as I straightened it. And uh, what I would do on this at home is look for the place where it's the shortest, like right here is where it isn't raveling. And that's because this is where it dips down as they cut. So I'd start right here, and you can see it is attached down at this end, and it's attached throughout the rest of it. But I'd start right here and pull one yarn. And then this is going to make it thread perfect. As I pull one yarn of the fabric, one thread, one yarn, properly it's called one yarn. And as I'd pull that, it would make a little wrinkled place and I could very easily track where that yarn is. Now sometimes you can pull it out completely and then just cut through the bare space it makes. With this, these threads are going to break easily. This is a silk uh, chiffon but it's going to break easily because it is so fine. And so it's better to just cut where the wrinkles are, just cut along. And as I hit the wrinkled parts, you can see it straightens out. And when I run out of wrinkles, when I don't have a track anymore, then you just pick up a new yarn there and pull it to make more wrinkles and cut along uh, as easily as you can until you come to another place where it's run out and you need to do the same thing again. But you do this first from selvage to selvage all the way across. That guarantees that you have it thread perfect and that it's going to hang nicely because this is really important for a quality garment. And then uh, after you get it uh, all straightened, then you're ready to go ahead and lay your pattern. Uh, if this would be a washable, if there would be any chance of shrinkage, then I'd pre-shrink it. This silk is going to be dry cleaned and I'm not going to worry about it, so I didn't pre-treat it in any way. Now what I actually put this over instead of the uh, white that I didn't want since it didn't do much for it, I looked all through my stash because I was doing this late at night. I seem to do a lot of sewing late at night and the stores just aren't very good about opening their doors for you at 2, 3 in the morning it seems. And so uh, what I did was just go through my stash to see what I had there and I found this uh, interlock, this t-shirt fabric that was also in a turquoise and I thought that might be just the ticket. And so that's what I have actually put this over as I quilted the vest. 
because of the color. And it gave a little bit of thickness, the same as, for instance, some cotton flannel would have done had I quilted it over that. So any fabric will do. It doesn't matter that this is a knit and this is a woven. By the time I quilt it, it's not going to be stretching at all. It's going to hold it in place. Now the things you're going to have to consider on this is what will you do with the seams, for one thing. You're going to also have to think about uh, how about the hem? It's going to have to be hemmed. Are you going to put a deep hem, a shallow one, a rolled one, a serger hem? Think about these things. How are you going to finish the seams? You can see through this one I have. It has dropped shoulders. You can see that I have a French seam here. And that's why I put a French seam, because you can see through the fabric. And it looks more expensive to have this French seam than it would have looked to do some other things. So I kind of like to look at ready to wear and at the price range and see what techniques they've used in the bargain basement ones and what techniques they've used in the very, very expensive, many hundred dollar designer ones. And I kind of like to use those techniques because they do make it look as elegant and as high a quality as possible. Well, I uh, also, as far as hems go, I could have done something like I have back on this skirt. This was from last series. And this was, if you remember it, a three-way skirt. There are three layers here, and you can turn it inside out, right side out, wear it with any of the layers on top. They all show at once because of this handkerchief hem. But you can see that here, this hem, I do have a serger rolled edge on. And uh, also for the seam, there aren't very many seams in this skirt, just one seam in each layer. But I use that same rolled hem uh, stitch as I serge those seams together because even though it's very fine and it looks fine when you see through it, it uh, is very, very um, thin and it's strong since the fabric's rolled around. So that's a possibility. But let me take this over to the table and I'll show you some other possibilities. Okay, what I'm going to do here is some seam finishes. And uh, this is the one that I have on the blouse I'm wearing, first of all. This is that French seam. Well, I've already stitched a little shallow seam, and usually you cut your seams 5 eighths. Uh, this one, I would probably stitch it a quarter or 3 eighths of an inch. And then I'm going to press it, not open, because a little seam like that you can't press open very easily. I would instead just press it to one side, if I can get this open. Okay, I would just press it to one side. And I might decide that I want this to be as fine as possible and not really show much. So before I press it, or after, whichever, it doesn't matter, I might even cut this down uh, still more, down to perhaps about an eighth of an inch, so that I can make a really nice, fine seam. And uh, anytime you have dropped shoulders, it's going to be oversized. But also, something nice that happens with dropped shoulders is that there is so little shape in that arm's eye. Instead of the big curve that you'd have under an arm if it came right up on your shoulder, with this, it's almost straight across uh, the top of it where the seam is. Therefore, you can do a French seam. If this would be real curvy, as a standard shoulder seam would be, then you don't want to do a French seam. You can't get it to go the other way if it's too curvy. Okay, so this is just going to be pressed, and I'll press this little seam to one side. I'll press it closed first, because it looks like it hasn't had that done yet. And once I have it pressed closed, then I'll press it open. I'm going to put my iron down considerably lower because it was a little bit hot for this. And that's what caused this, uh, so we won't worry about it. We're just worried about the seam. It's nice to always uh, be sure you know where your iron is at from one project to another because uh, it certainly does take different temperatures. And I am only having this much trouble stitching or pressing this because right now it is still too warm. And otherwise it would slide over it very easily. Okay, once I have this pressed, then I'm going to press it the other direction. I want to close this because I'm going to stitch it, and I want to close it right on the stitching line there, and then give that a little press, and then you take it to the machine and just sew it the other way so that the raw edges are enclosed between the layers, and this really gives it a nice look. Okay, then it's just straight stitch is all you're going to do. Just uh, find some little a uh, place either on the throat plate or else on the foot that you can follow and make a straight line. But it's just going to be a little narrow seam. Since I cut it down to an eighth, it only needs to be wide enough to cover that raw edge, but not too terribly wide so that it, uh, oh, it looks finer. It looks a little bit uh, more expensive if you keep this as fine as possible. Okay, now this is not a transparent fabric that I'm using, but here's the idea. There would be the French seam and then you press it open, 
and all the raw edge is enclosed and it looks fine on the right side. So this is one technique you might use and it might be the best one depending on whether it's straight or curved, depending on whether it's in a place where it'll show. Um, weigh the alternatives. This is usually what you see though around under the arm of a sleeve or around the neckline or wherever. Anytime you have a curve, uh, you can't do that French seam. It simply won't curve the other direction. And so what you might do instead, here's an alternative, I might trim this down to about a quarter of an inch. And then there are several very uh, fine little trico um, bindings that you can buy by the package. And I have a couple brands up here. And what I usually like to do, what I definitely like to do with these is not take them out of the package because what happens if you drop it on the floor, the whole thing will unroll and you're not going to get it rolled up very easily. So what I always do on these packages is just make a little slit in the covering and reach my tweezers in and get a hold of the end and pull it out. And what I want of this is just a little bit to bind that. But anyway, this protects it so it won't come undone. And uh, notice how they have a little joining here. And probably I would like to, if, if this would happen on my garment, I might like to avoid that. I might like to cut it off here and use the part without a joining. On this, it isn't going to make any difference. But if there is a joining and if you are going to use it, that tells you which is the right and wrong side of this fabric anyway. Now, when I sew this on, I'm going to pull it slightly. And notice how it wants to curl toward the back side. And so I'm going to put it on so it curls toward that way. And, that, and then it will just bind this edge very nicely. But this blends in well by the time it would be inside a garment. It really wouldn't show all that much. And you do this in one step. You don't bother to do it twice. I'll just put a pin here to get it started. You do it in one step. Just fold it over the raw edge and uh, get it pinned down. And then if it's easier for you, do a slight zigzag there if you want to because that way it guarantees that you are going to catch the bottom edge as well as the top. Now I almost always try to fold this, and you can see right here at the start maybe, I fold it so the under layer is a little bit longer than the upper layer, and in doing that then you will catch both of them. But feel free to go ahead and zigzag if you want to so that uh, you make sure that you catch it. And I'm going to just turn it to a zigzag because it uh, did seem to want to do that. And I'm going to narrow the stitches down, and I'm going to make the length longer. Okay, about like this ought to be fine. And then we can just do a little zigzag stitch. And uh, I like to use this in the needle down position because that way it'll hold every time I need to adjust this and around a very big curve, you do need to l raise the presser foot and do some adjusting. So I'm raising it with the knee lift here. And uh, just every few stitches stop. If you need to, go ahead and baste it on first or pin it all on first, but ordinarily just adjusting it as you go along will do the job. Well, anyway, here's another choice. And so by the time you have this finished, you have a raw edge bound. And of course, by the time you use uh, the same color threads instead of a contrast, it would blend in nicely and it really wouldn't show very much. So there's another choice. Uh, the other one, of course, would be on the serger. So whatever you find works well for you. Go ahead and do it that way. Now down at the bottom of this blouse, I'm going to have to have a hem of some sort. And there again, it might be that rolled hem on the serger, or it might be a little rolled hem on the machine. And I don't want a really tiny rolled hem. If you want that, then you have a rolled hem foot probably with your machine, or one that you can get at least. This one I want to be a little bit wider. And what I am going to do with it, and I hope the iron has cooled down a little bit by now, I think maybe it'll work. That first fabric I was using was a polyester. This one was a silk. And a silk will take a little bit hotter iron. So I think we'll be all right. But what I've done is run one stitching line, just a straight stitch line. And the reason for this is that you can fold it very easily right on that line. And ordinarily, when you use the same color thread especially, it doesn't even show. You don't even know where that stitching line is when you get finished with this hem. But uh, I would like to press all this down right along my stitched line. And then after I get this pressed down, I'll press it a second time so that I have the raw edge turned under. And then after this raw edge is turned under here, then you would just straight stitch that along the edge. 
Okay, I would just press it down again like this and go ahead and run two rows of stitching, one right on this edge, one on that edge, or maybe just one row of stitching. And especially at the bottom of the blouse when I'm not going to see it. If this, if this would be hemming the bottom of a sleeve that will show, then I would possibly do the two rows of stitching because this you'll find on most of the um, expensive ones and the ready to wear. Sometimes they also do a hand rolled hem here and it may or may not look uh, the best. Sometimes it looks a little homemade if you do that ham. All you can do is try it out, see which looks the best. Well, what else I've done on this is have a little tie belt down at the bottom. That one is underlined with uh, a little bit of just lining fabric is what I have in here, just to give it that same depth of color. But I didn't want to make it as heavy as the quilted part is. So something thin like that worked out best here. If I'm going to bind the edges, what I like to do with these very thin fabrics is not just cut a bias binding that uh, curves around once. I like to instead cut that extra wide and on the ironing board uh, just press this in half first and then put the raw edges to the raw edge of the garment and stitch the two together and after they're stitched uh, flip it to the back side and uh, after it's stitched once then we just flip it back here and then probably stitch in the ditch as I've done many times. Just stitch right there and it catches the back side. But what I'm folding to the back is the fold of the fabric. And because that folds there, it's already finished. So this is an easy way to bind the edges. And I've bound the neckline of this vest in that way. It's perhaps under the collar now and maybe doesn't show, but that's how I've bound it. Now these bias tubes turn so easily, of course, they're so nice and slippery. They just go right over that fast turn and really turn easily. Uh, because I wanted these uh, little tubes hanging here, I actually did and or started out with fabric about this wide. And when I stitched it, I folded it. So I had more than one layer of fabric here as I stitched these tubes. And uh, what it did was pat it, but not stiffen it. If I had put some cable cord in it, it would have stiffened it. By just having the fabric in there, it makes them opaque, and yet, and it pads them out a little bit, and yet they stay real soft. I'll tell you in a minute why I have those. They weren't uh, part of the original plan. Okay, what I've done then for the rest of the vest is uh, just do a little bit of stitching. And of course, you always try it out first on the scrap of fabric. What I was trying out is different colors because this has a lot of different colors in it, the print that's in this fabric. So I thought, well, I might use several different color threads. I was trying to make it look like water and lily pads and that type thing, kind of uh, looking like a, if you drop something in the water, the way those waves uh, move away from it. That's the look I wanted, kind of like scribbling on paper like this, just going back and forth because that's what this fabric looks like. It has little areas of look like kind of scribbled. And so I wanted to just follow those along and take a cue from the fabric. You don't have to be completely original in all these things you do. You really can just use what's already there, what's hinted at, and then go along with that look. I'm going to change feet here because I'm going to do some free motion stitching. And I'm also going to uh, put it back on straight stitch rather than zigzag. And I also am going to need to drop the feed dog since I can uh, go any direction with this. There it's on straight stitch. And I have this wonderful little acrylic uh, plate here. There are two of them, in fact. If I'm going to be doing any uh, uh, computerized embroidery, automatic embroidery there, there's a different acrylic cover. But this is nice because it brings the machine up and you have this flat bed, and it's especially nice for this process that I'm going to do. But I'll first need to uh, lower the feed dog here. And once it's lowered and no longer in play, then I can do the next process easily. Now I'm just going to put this in a hoop. I have another little scrap here. And these hoops are nice. Don't use one of those little tiny ones because you have too little a, an area to work with that way. So use a bigger hoop this way. And I'll just take this out and put it on top. That section's on the bottom, this section's on top. And what I'm going to do is actually just scribble with this the way I did on that paper. I just want the stitches to go back and forth. And actually, they were going back and forth in the same direction as the print of the fabric. But the way I have it in the hoop, it's easier to do it this way. So I'll go ahead and do this. And uh, once you practice this for about a half a minute, you become an expert at it. And it works very, very easily. So all you need to do is get this down. And any place where I started, I did a little drop of water. 
It's telling me, do you know that the feed dog's down? And yes, I do know it, but thank you for telling me. So I'm just going to turn this around a little bit like this so that I have um, it started and then I won't have to, I'll raise that so I can cut it off. Then I won't have to worry about tying a knot or anything if I just put little puddles here and there, little drops of water. And then it's just taking a hold of this hoop and stitch fast, but move the hoop slowly. And it's just moving it back and forth in no regular uh, way. And if some stitches are a little larger and some smaller, which they will be when you first start, it's okay. It isn't that noticeable. Who's going to look at it that closely? It's the general effect that you want. And if you decide that, whoops, I needed more stitches up here. So that's fine. Go back. You do have a second, third, fourth chance, as many chances as you want with this. But it's just sort of like scribbling on paper. This is very simple, and everybody can do this very successfully. And if you need some more little clumps of it here and there, then go ahead and put another little droplet here and go over here. If you would do this with metallic thread, it might be pretty, and those drops would really show up nicely. So that's another possibility. And once you have all that done, then you just take it out of the hoop, go on to another area, and you can do the same thing again. So this is kind of a fun thing. Now I told you, uh, after I, this took considerable time, by the way, to do the whole vest, front and back, to do all that stitching all over. It wasn't a big deal. I did use uh, rayon thread rather than uh, metallic, because I thought, well, I wanted to keep it a little more subdued, but look watery. so. The shiny rayon thread seemed to be a good direction to go, but it did take a lot of time. And I got the vest all finished and I put it on. And I often am asked by you people, do I ever make a mistake? I make them constantly. Anybody who never admits to making a mistake, let's face it, this is a person who never does anything. Because you learn by your mistakes and uh, the more you do, you're bound, the law of averages, you're bound to make some mistakes. Well, what I did is got all this done. I put buttonholes in it, by the way, and there again, try out the buttonholes to make sure you know what you're doing. I did have machine buttonholes, and I wanted to see whether it would blend in better to have which of these two colors of thread. Well, anyway, I had buttonholes going down the front, and I had buttons sewn on. And I put it on, and it wouldn't come anywhere near buttoning. I don't know what I did. I had changed from the pattern a little bit. And I did one of the things I told you not to do, probably, subtracted seams instead of adding them or whatever. But it didn't even overlap. It didn't even come together in front. Now, I never shed tears about things like that when I have spent all this time doing the stitching. What I instead think is, OK, I have provided myself with creative opportunity. Let your mind wander. See what it comes up with. Weigh the possibilities. What I decided is I had to have something come across, come over here, so that I could join them. And what I have done is this paper. I've just uh, done this squiggly line that looks sort of similar to all the quilting that I did. And uh, I did this on the paper, I, just a pencil line. I put that on top of my layers of fabric and stitched it. And then you can see I just tore off the paper after I had it stitched right through the paper so that it would uh, come out kind of looking like the quilting stitches that I had done. And this is the extra panel that I added. And then when you have that panel added, it needs to be joined in some way. So I put a little bit of piping here between the layers. And then because I had that straight line with everything else a curvy line, I thought, OK, some more straight lines. Let's hang all these tubes, because they always do such a beautiful job uh, on sheer fabrics. And then it hit me that, oh, yes, I got these wonderful beads. They were sea glass, you know, kind of um, uh, polished, or not polished glass, kind of dull glass. I had all these beads I brought back from Australia. This is what I do when I travel. I bring back notions and fabrics and things. These are my souvenirs from all over. And uh, so these were just perfect. Now these beads did not have a very big hole. And what I did to pull the fabric through the beads is just take some thread, a double thickness of it, and knot it, and attach that to the end of the tube of fabric, and then just really pull it hard through the tube. And if it goes all the way through, then fine tie a knot on the other end and cut the fabric off short. If you really can't get it all the way through, as I couldn't on this one, but I came through with the needle, and then I attached another little bead, one that I have over here. These came from San Diego. I, I know where I got everything practically. OK, well, anyway, I just came through this bead and then back up again so I could tie a knot up here in the fabric, because the needle goes through even if the fabric won't. 
There are always alternatives, and if your mind runs dry, go shopping, go look at the ready-to-wear, go look in a bead shop maybe, or in a fabric shop, and see what things you can find that remind you of some other alternatives here. Now these little beads, I decided to just put a few of them there also. I'm going to sew those on with a fine thread, uh, like some of the embroidery thread that I was using, the rayon thread and also from the original buttons and buttonholes that I want, they're no longer appropriate. Now I simply have snaps under this to hold it in place. But since I do have these tubes of fabric, there are other fasteners that you could use. Think about having a couple little tubes that tie in a few places. That might be a pretty thing. Uh, think about what else you can do. It just goes on and on and there is no end to it. Everybody's going to have something different and that's the fun part about it. Well, moving away from this transparency, let's go on another direction. Let's look at fabrics so dense that they present other challenges. Join me next time for Deep Purple.